to watch a professional wrestling show that doesn't insult my intelligence. AEW Dynamite, Wednesday, November 10th, 2021. Now, just two nights away from full gear. The final exclamation point for AEW on the year, and you know they want to make an impact. And with this card, they may do just that. We kick the night off with Brian Danielson versus Rocky Romero, Orange Cassidy in Rocky's corner. For those not familiar to who the hell Rocky Romero is, well, this dude is signed to New Japan Pro Wrestling. And even though he's 39 years old, he wrestles like he's still 29. Proving yet again that age is just a number when it comes to talent, training, and total work ethic. Three categories that Rocky Romero checks off every time. And flipping the switch back over to Brian Danielson, if I may. What more can we say about this dude? Every match he's in, it just feels feels like it's a main event. It could be in there with Rocky Romero. And there was moments last night I felt this dude just feels special. There was only one time that I can remember his career where I was kind of like, nah, not feeling this. And that was, of course, WrestleMania 37 against Roman and Edge. I felt he was not needed, and it just muddied the waters between Edge and Roman. And even Brian Danielson, after that match, admitted he didn't really feel comfortable in that situation and didn't know why he was there. Well, let me, let me tell you exactly why you were there. It's because Vinny Mac wanted you to yes your way around the ring to get the stadium yesing with you. He thought it would be a fun little visual. But it's really good to see Brian Danielson know that he not only was he not needed in that triple threat of WrestleMania, he shouldn't have been there. It's always cool when a dude can admit that. And it should have just been Edge and Roman anyway, I digress. Every other time this dude is out there, just feels special. This match went about 10 minutes in length. Rocky taps out to Danielson. And the next task at hand for Brian will be monumental. And it'll be this Saturday at Full Gear against Miro in the World Title Eliminator Tournament. I know the world is already putting the title on Hangman Page. I get it. But I'd be lying if I said the thought of Danielson vs. Omega, title on the line, in an Iron Man match, didn't intrigue BC. Because it does! <laughs> Could you imagine? Danielson, Omega, Iron Man match, title on the line! Fuck, that sounds amazing! But I understand... We gotta give it to Hangman Page. He's deserving. It's a long story. It has to happen. This is his time. Everything, all the talking points that we're hearing by the AEW faithful. But damn, that other situation. (laughs) It would be a damn good fun ride, wouldn't it? Next up was Dan Lambert. Either way, by the way, man, no matter what, Miro Danielson this Saturday night and Hangman Page and Omega, come on, bro. Two two absolute bangers in the making on paper, and I feel they can absolutely deliver in that ring this weekend. Next up, Dan Lambert, Ethan Page, Scorpio Sky, American Top Team. They all absolutely annihilate the inner circle. After the attack, Dan Lambert talks a lot of shit and even locks Jericho in his own submission holds and then talks some more shit. 
<laughs> this was one of those beatings where you just gotta believe this Saturday. The inner circle isn't just gonna get the victory, but they're gonna get ultimate revenge on America Top Team, on Dan Lambert, on Paige, on Scorpio Sky. You gotta believe that this is gonna be an ultimate revenge beating from the inner circle. It's gonna be interesting how they play that out because last night it looked like a car crash and it looked like looked like Dan Lambert was in full control and definitely had the inner circle's number. Be interesting to see what they got planned there. I'm not a big fan of Schmaz matches. You guys know that. So on paper, I'm not really looking forward to that match all that much. But after last night's beating, you got to believe something big is in store for the inner circle. Next was a six-woman Schmaz. AEW champion Britt Baker, Jamie Hayter, and Rebel versus Tay Conti on Thunder Rosa and Anna J. Now, I'm not a fan of multi-person schmoz matches, as I just said about 45 seconds ago. However, seeing Tay Conti in there with my girl Britt Baker, I'm willing to... I'm willing to hold my displeasure for these type of matches and try to enjoy it. However, there wasn't much time to enjoy it because it was only six minutes long. And nearly three of those minutes we spent in commercial. So this was really about three minutes of actual uh, action that we got to witness without any distraction. Mm, basically, this accomplished nothing. Let's be honest. Six minute match, three minutes spent in commercial. It's a fucking schmoz match anyway. Let's be honest, this accomplished nothing. If the goal was to get people more excited about Britt Baker versus Ty Conti at full gear, mission not accomplished. This is one of those situations where those that want to see this match this weekend are pumped for it. Those that aren't pumped for it probably still don't give a fuck. I digress. I still love Britt Baker and I always like seeing Ty Conti up in there. But again, schmoz matches, I'm going to say this in the most calm way possible so everybody can understand, comprehend, even those in the back of the room, you can understand these words. Schmoz matches will never give you your desired outcome. It's the best way I could put it. If you're a booker of pro wrestling and you have a big pay-per-view match that you want to get eyeballs to, you want to attract and captivate audience and viewers to, a schmoz will never do that. Moving on. Jungle Boy versus Anthony Bowens. Max Caster shreds the boy from the jungle before the match in his pre-match rap. Even <laughs> referencing Jungle Boy and Anna Jay's relationship. Max Caster has been on lately, man. I mean, if you can sling some bars, this is a pretty generic gimmick, right? Uh, whether you call it a, another John Cena type role or not. We've seen many people that can sling bars and they try to make that their gimmick. And it's not really all that creative. You're just putting some rhymes together. Anybody that can sling bars knows exactly... Uh, how to pull that character off. But Caster's been giving out some zingers as of late, man. He's been he's been kind of captivating on the mic, I gotta say. Now the match itself. And, and, and by the way, most likely uh, these zingers that Caster was slinging, most likely it just gave Jungle Boy more fuel to his fire because he ended up tapping out Bowens with that snare trap. And then post-match... After Jungle Boy defeated Bowens, Bobby Fish attacks the Jungle Boy. Now, this brings out Luchasaurus and Christian. I'm kind of done seeing Christian just playing this role, you know? Whether they just have nothing for him or he's just injured. Just seeing him be a third wheel in the Jurassic Express. Man, I thought they had a lot more planned for Christian. Um, but I'm starting to see this too much. Once every now and again, once every blue moon, that's cool. But damn, the dude's eventually going to have to have his own identity and not just come to the save 
the fucking saving grace of Jungle Boy or the saving grace of Luchasaurus. He can't save the fucking world. At some point, he's going to want to ask for the world. Anyway, that's a little side rant. I'm Christian, always being used to make the save. Anyway, back to this Bobby Fish uh, taking out Jungle Boy. Uh, you gotta believe Bobby Fish is doing some dirty work for Adam Cole, baby! Ahead of uh, their fucking schmoz match this weekend. Jurassic Express versus Adam Cole and the Young Bucks. But it was just, when you saw Bobby Fish attack Jungle Boy, you kind of thought, shit, did Adam Cole put him up to that, right? And you know in NXT, they were Undisputed Era together. With O'Reilly and Strong. And then backstage, about a segment or two later, they actually had Bobby Fish walk in on a... On a Backstage interview with Adam Cole and the Young Bucks, and it was pretty cool, man. Pretty much solidified that Adam Cole put Bobby Fish up to that, man. Uh, could you imagine if they could pull one more son of a bitch? You gotta believe that O'Reilly's O'Reilly's position in WWE's NXT brand, it's not that secure. I'm not saying AEW has any room to fit somebody like O'Reilly. But if he did come in and Adam Cole did break away from the elite or super elite, super click, whatever the fuck they want to call themselves, if Adam Cole ever wanted to break away, start his own group, could you imagine if he had an undisputed era in AEW? Would you guys like that? Would it be just a bootleg knockoff version, even though it's the same participants, basically, minus a strong? Would you guys mind redoing that in AEW? Would that be pretty cool shit? And you're down for it? Or would you just say, nah, leave that shit behind in NXT. Let's start fresh. Let's start new. We don't need to see Undisputed Era in AEW. I don't know how you guys feel about it. Personally, I wouldn't mind it, man. I thought they were kick-ass in NXT. I think they would be in AEW as well. And don't forget, man, BC has been telling you this for a while now. I just feel Adam Cole is better when he's the leader of a group. I love Kenny Omega. I just don't like Adam Cole behind Kenny Omega. Anyway, I don't know. When I saw Bobby Fish attack Jungle Boy, I couldn't help but think, huh, could you imagine if we had a little Adam Cole stable with his old boys in NXT, man? Um, Our number one ended with an awesome hype package for Kingston and Punk, man. Eddie Kingston, CM Punk. And part of that hype package, they, they kind of replayed some of that uh, just awesome, man. And I, I hate using that word in pro wrestling because it's overused. Awesome. You know, everything is awesome these days and it's just not true. But that, that promo, man, it was awesome for so many reasons. And I saw AEW knockers, people that trash AEW for no reason. They probably don't even watch the product. And they're like, I don't know what everyone's happy about, man. I don't know what everyone's raving about. It was a pretty standard, basic, generic promo. It wasn't awesome. It wasn't epic. And I'm like, dude, shut the fuck down. Shut up, dog. It was absolutely awesome. It was absolutely epic. Not just what was being blasted toward one another, but the mannerisms, the motions, Kingston moving in and out, and weaving in and out, back and forth into Punk's face and back and kind of rotating the ring the manners of you could tell Eddie Kingston was in a zone it was still real to him damn it for Eddie Kingston this was all too real punk actually looked shook now yeah this is pro wrestling man they're, they're talking backstage what they're gonna do they got their bullet points it's pre-planned right it's pro wrestling but punk looked shook Punk looked like he knew Kingston was taking it to another level, and Punk had to up his game from what they talked about in the back earlier. It was that type of believability that made that promo come to life. It wasn't just what they were saying, bro. It wasn't just Punk calling Kingston a bum. It wasn't just Kingston telling Punk, Nobody wants you here! Nobody ever wanted you here, so get out! These were quotes. This promo is so damn epic. So anybody saying it wasn't, you don't understand pro wrestling. You just want to bash AEW because your own fucking miserable existence isn't sufficing for your own entertainment. Tough shit, Jack. Anyway, can you tell I love that fucking 
promo this past Friday night and, and them replaying some of that in this hype package. You got JR, you got Excalibur, and you got everybody giving heartfelt commentary on how they feel this match is going to go down, why it's so personal, why it's so fucking epic, why it feels special. You know, I'm going to let you guys on on a little secret here. And if you saw my review from this past Friday, you know damn sure what I'm about to say. One of the main matches I'm looking forward to the most. It doesn't have a fucking year-long storyline. Like a fucking... Or, or two years like a fucking page in Omega. Or longer than that, actually, if you want to jump into their their past, their history. But it doesn't have some long-term storytelling, actually. Not that long. It doesn't have a title on the line. There's no gimmick. One of the matches I'm looking forward to the most is Eddie Kingston versus CM Punk. Just because to BC, that is pro wrestling! At its core! At its damn foundation! Anyway. Yeah, I was pretty pumped for that, uh... Uh, that uh, hype package at the end of hour number one. Now, now we started hour number two with Wardlow versus Wheeler, Utah. Now, Wardlow treated Wheeler like he was the Brooklyn brawler from back in the day. <laughs> this dude got his ass whooped from pillar to post. Four power bombs, I believe. Maybe a fifth if I blinked. But the dude received four power bombs in a beating for the ages. And with that win, check this out, guys. I couldn't believe this. He went into this thing 19-3. and three. With that win, Wardlow is now 20-3 and three in AEW. Single competition, anyway. 20-3 and three for Wardlow. Uh, I, I can't but bu- Wardlow is 20-3, and three, bro! I didn't realize that quietly, they're booking this dude pretty strongly. You know, he's always just been kind of the second or third wheel even at points to an MJF. Or when MJF was in cahoots with Jericho, he was like a sixth or seventh dude. But quietly, Wardlow, man, 20 and 3, I couldn't believe. I thought they kind of screwed up the graphic when it said 19 and 3 going into the match. Oh, I got to keep my eye more closely now on Wardlow, guys. I think they're doing something big with this son of a bitch. Um, so, well, uh, with, with, yeah, and then, like I said, he did win that, uh, obviously. I mean, he just beat the shit out of poor Wheeler. Post match, Matt Hardy destroys Orange Cassidy, delivering a twist of fate with a steel chair wrapped around Cassidy's neck like it was a scarf. One of MJF's scarfs, but it was it was a steel chair, man. Matt Hardy getting a little vicious. Matt Hardy tapping into his fucking. His prime days. Still still carrying on that beef with the Cassie that is orange. Up next we had, uh, now check this. This is Dante Martin and Leo Rush versus Moriarty and Sadell. Full disclosure. When I saw these four men in the ring. Hold on, let me get a sip of coffee before I talk about this. Because I'm, I'm going to be so honest with you, with you guys, as I always am. Let me get a swig of coffee and we're going to jump into this tag match. Ah. All right, so Dante Martin, Leo Rush, Moriarty, Sadell. When I saw these four men in the ring before the bell rang, I rolled my eyes. Full disclosure, because I'm thinking this is your full gear. Go home show. Nobody needs to see this filler shit. But two minutes into this match, BC was like, damn, this is fun. Leo looks like he's having fun again. It was so damn good to see Leo in there just finding his groove again. Matt Sedell is not only a damn good wrestler. In fact, I put him in a John Morrison category. Absolutely. I'll repeat that. I put him in a John Morrison category. That's how good I believe Matt Sedell actually is. But he's also a damn solid shit talker. (laughs) <laughs> we found that out even more last night. And Dante continues to be a highlight reel. I mean, for a nine-minute match, BC says, fuck yeah. The crowd chanted, this is awesome during the match. Let's not get carried away, please. Awesome and that this is awesome chant should be reserved for the greatest of matches. Right? You're thinking of matches like Undertaker, Shawn Michaels, WrestleMania 25, things like that. That's when you break out an awesome chant. 
I'll even give you that for a Daniel Bryan Omega part one, because there will be a part two and should be a part three in the future, by the way. But I'll give you that shit. Uh, But we can't claim it for every match that's fun or really good. In fact, if BC was in attendance, I'd sure as fuck be chanting, This is really good! This is really good! Now, I understand. (laughs) That probably doesn't have the right flow. But I would be honest, at least, right? It might not flow very naturally or sound very good, but it would be honest. And damn it, that's what BC is. So we should all be chanting, this is really good, because that tag match filler was actually really good. But when we call everything awesome, what happens, guys, and you may think I'm nitpicking, by the way, but what the fuck do you think the channel is for? I critique pro wrestling. Of course I'm gonna nitpick! Anyway, if you claim this is awesome for every good match, or even really good match, I mean, what is really gonna feel special when something is actually awesome or even epic? You guys know I'm right, man. I just wish as a wrestling community, and I'm not even blaming fans. We don't have anything else. So that's all we really chant when we want to show a sign of respect. So I totally get it. I just wish as a community, we could think of more more chants, right? We have Fight Forever. That's one that I feel is a little bit more reserved. We only use that in specific um, placements. So that one, at least I feel as a fan base... We kind of protected Fight Forever. We did not protect This Is Awesome. And I feel like that has been just now the chant for every match that is good. I wish we had something else, man. Uh, I don't know. That's my side rant that I'll always fucking flip out on. Anyway, this tag match again, I rolled my eyes before the bell rang. and And when the match was over, I was like, shit, I could go another 10 minutes with these four. Next up, Dax Harwood versus... Oh, I'm sorry. Dax Harwood versus Tully Blanchard, huh? what I miss, BC? Uh, Dax Harwood with the Tully Blanchard. This was a rare singles match for Dax. Actually was the main event because the final slot was the contract signing for the world title. We'll get to that in a couple minutes. But Dax Harwood was the main event versus the Bastard Pack. Or as Justin Robertson... Uh, Justin Robertson... He, he, well, how's he, how's he fucking introduce him? He's a bastard. (laughs) That's what he says. He's a bastard. I love it. Anyway, this was such a hard hitting physical main event, man. Pack would tap out eventually to Harwood, um, or would tap out Harwood, not the other way around. My bad. Pac won this match, tapping out Harwood. But that was just the beginning of the wild ride, to be honest, because Cash Wheeler hits the ring afterwards and jumps Pac. Then the lights go out, and Malachi Black and Andrade are standing middle of the ring. Everybody starts destroying Dax until Cody hits the ring. This could have been done a lot better if they just let it breathe. Like, I understand what they were trying to go for. Malachi, you got Andrade out there. Cody's coming down uh, the, the fucking the, through the crowd. I don't know what the fuck Cody's coming through the crowd for, by the way. You run the company! Naturally, believably, re- realism would tell us you're in the back, man. You're in Gorilla. But we're supposed to believe you're just in the stands getting a hot dog? In a fucking sippy cup? A slushy? This fucking... Hoodie's unzipped? What are you doing in the concession stands? You're Cody. I don't know why the fuck this dude is coming down the crowd like he's Mox. (sighs) And I love Cody, by the way, man. I I love Cody. I take some heat for that, actually, sometimes, man. People are like, oh, Cody's overrated. Cody shouldn't have won this match. Cody books himself too strong. Blah, blah, blah. I like Cody, man, to be honest. I'll tell you when, when some shit does, doesn't make sense. When he beat Malachi a couple weeks ago. That doesn't make sense. I don't want to hear long-term storytelling. I don't want to hear this is going to be better in the end because of it. No. Malachi already beat Cody. So then you turn around a couple weeks later and have Malachi lose to Cody? You're going to 50-50 book and try to tell me that's going to help a story. Stop it. Malachi's first loss should not have been Cody. And Cody is... Is my dude. He's my jam. I'm just being honest with you. I also don't understand why he's coming through the fucking crowd. Anyway, 
I understand what they were trying to go for. However, they needed to let this breathe. It needed more time. And I think they gave more time to the match itself because they saw that it was going good. So they gave them maybe another minute or two. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. More wrestling for a good wrestling match. Okay. But the post-match activity was then rushed and suffered subsequently. It's just what happened. You guys can go back and watch again to see what I really mean. You got to be careful with Malachi, bro. You keep booking him like he's just another member of a squad. And he will be looked at as just another dude. I mean, the, the way they're booking him as of late, he's just coming across the BC anyway as just another dude. And I know, I'll get people going, relax, BC, it's going to be all right, man. It's not that big of a deal, man. He's fine. It's way better than WWE's booking. You're absolutely correct. It is. I'm just starting to notice, man. I mean, as of late, he's losing to Cody, which should have never happened. Uh, that's not even fucking debatable to BC. That is just fucking asinine that he would beat him and then you 50-50 book him within two weeks later, just to do it again, like, that can't be the story, but then he, so he loses to Cody, and then he's just showing up with, like, other people now, and it doesn't even feel like a house of black is forming to me, he's just showing up and, and helping out Dax and, and Cash Wheeler, and they're already with Tully Blanchard, and you have Andrade there, it just seems odd, that's, that, that seems like an odd fit to me, Andrade and Malachi are damn good wrestlers, Damn good matches together one-on-one. -on -one. I don't know if Andrade fits in the House of Black. Time will tell. I don't know. This dude, I mean, that was a... Tw go back and watch it, man. Lights go out, and when they come up, Malachi's in there with fucking Andrade, and they all just start pounding down on Pack. And about fucking half a minute later, the segment is basically over. I think more focus was... I, I don't know. I, I don't know, man. Uh, you, you know, Malachi. Ah, creatively, I just have all these ideas for Malachi, man. And it doesn't involve a fucking 30 second segment. I think the lights going out, they stayed out for longer than the actual segment, man. The lights seem to be out for like fucking 30 seconds itself. Just be careful, all right? I'm not, I'm not sounding the panic alarm here. Relax. For everybody saying, BC, relax, man. You relax. I'm not pushing the panic alarm. My duty here on this channel is to review. That's why thousands of people tune into this channel and these reviews to listen to my words. Because at moments of concern, you will hear about them. This is just a concerning moment to watch out for. That's all. We're not sounding the panic alarm. We're just saying, hey, Tony, just be careful, bro. You're walking a little line here where I'm telling you guys, man, you, you can't just think of the diehard fans that we are, right? We're diehard fans. We get it. We know all the ins and outs. We know the behind the scenes. We're a different breed. But you guys also have to think about casuals and such. Who want to really give Malachi a, a fair shake. But when you start to see somebody booked kind of just like another dude for show after show. He starts to just become another dude. You start to lose that special feel. First couple of months of Malachi, man. The dude, every time he showed up, it felt special. It's starting to feel like, oh, Malachi, what's he doing? What is he doing this week? He's going to help out. He's going to beat up Pac. Okay. He's going to help out all these other dudes. He doesn't seem like that, man. Careful. Same thing I say about Adam Cole, baby. If he's just another dude in somebody else's faction for too long, you are actually going to damage him. Maybe not for you or BC the diehard fan, but for everyone else, you'll damage them. And there's just no reason to do that. 
You know, and and, and I have faith in Tony Khan, man. Tony Khan has not really dropped the ball on anybody's booking. Brian Cage may argue that and maybe some other people in AEW because the more people they get, they kind of get pushed back a little bit. So maybe they're not that happy. We know what Brian Cage and his wife has said about AEW and Tony Khan. They're not too happy with the way they're being booked. Uh, BC thought they were being booked just fine, to be honest. But I understand some people may not be happy, but from the outside looking in, man, Tony Khan seems to be juggling everybody pretty decently. These are just concerns that you might want to look out for. Careful. Malachi is starting to look like just another dude. He's too special to be such. Same thing with uh, people like Adam Cole. So anyway, those might not be popular words, but damn it, you're going to hear the utmost fucking truth and how BC is truly feeling on these reviews. I ain't going to hold anything back. Just because some people might get upset about it, man. These are just booking uh, booking things that need to be looked at a little bit more carefully going forward. Other than that, man, a pretty solid main event. I'll tell you that much. And again, I think they gave it... It was so good, I think they gave it another minute or two. And that's what... Maybe rushed that final segment. Maybe, you know, if you gave that final segment a little bit more... Or the post-match segment, I should say, of that main event. If you gave it a little bit more time, another minute or two, and you let it breathe... Maybe everyone would have looked a a little bit more better and special and in a better light. But because it was so rushed, it was kind of like shit. You know, like that was fucking... uh, I don't know if that was any better than seeing like Kevin Owens in 30 second segments getting beat up by Mad Cat Moss and Happy Corbin or Owens stone cold stunnering Ninja Tazawa in 30 seconds and then walking away. I always told you guys those were weird 30 second segments that doesn't do anything for anybody. I don't feel that post match activity did anything for anybody including Cody versus Malachi for the future. It did nothing to make me go, shit, need to see that again. Woo! Man, that coffee is hitting, man. So the final segment of the night in the main event slot was the actual contract signing between Paige and Omega, the world title contract signing for Full Gear. This was so well done, bro. There was such a believability in the words Paige was saying to Omega and vice versa. Now, was it a believability and a realism to the point of Punk and Kingston Friday? No. But you felt the words, man. You saw the look in Paige's eye when he spoke to Omega. And this was a pretty long table that they were sitting at the ends of. But he was staring that beam right into Omega's eyes, man. And he wanted Omega to feel those words. And Omega played his manipulating bastard self perfectly, man. He tried to manipulate Paige the entire time. It was us that always pulled you out of your dark times. It was us always picking you up when you were down. This, all of this in AEW, this was for you. And when it was all said and done, Omega, Omega actually got Paige to shake his hand. And I'm thinking the whole time, like, dude, you can't trust Omega, bro. Like, don't shake his hand. And Paige was manipulated enough to the point where Paige shook the hand of Omega. And you just knew Omega was about to play that dude. You just knew Omega was going to play Hangman. And sure enough, he played Hangman. Sure enough, wham, bam, wabaka. The cameraman slams his camera into Hangman's dome piece. Hangman is busted open as the cameraman reveals himself as Don Callis. Page then signs the contract in Hangman's blood. So well done, bro. You didn't even move mountains. You didn't have to get super creative here. Sometimes, if you just use the basic fundamentals of pro wrestling to tell a story, it's going to sit in your lap. This is all they needed to do. Sit them down at a table, a traditional contract signing, You make it real, you make it believable, you make everybody hang on everybody's every word, and then you do something really fucking cool at the end. Again, simplistic! The handshake where everyone's like, no! The cameraman ends up being Don Callis, Hangman's busted open, the contract signed in blood, Omega and Callis standing over, a down and out, Hangman as we fade to black and go off the air. Come on, bro! That is how you do it. That's all we ask for. We ne- we're not asking anybody on any show to move mountains. We're just saying, give a fuck. 
And sometimes it can be simplistic. Sometimes the most simplistic shit is the best. If you have the right people in there at the right time, in the right situation, pulling the right strings, you'll get something like this, man. And I thought that was the way to go off the air for your go-home show to full gear. And that's it, guys. Full gear is two days away. There is no more talking about it. We're no longer going to talk about it. Time now for the boys and gals of AEW to do the deed and hopefully rock this world of professional wrestling to its core. And I sure as fuck hope they do just that. To everybody in AEW, all the boys and gals, I would wish you good luck for this weekend, but truthfully, you ain't gonna need it. Because everything you need to put on the show of your lifetimes this weekend, you already possess in your arsenal. You already have the keys to the kingdom. Now all you gotta do is go out there and rock the world of professional wrestling. Go out there and knock pro wrestling on its ass. And we will all be along for the ride. The Amplified Man. This was your Dynamite 11 10 21 review. Until next time. We'll talk this weekend. Rampage. Full gear. The time for talk is done. Let's get it on. Check you later.